Alcohol absolutely dominates society. Every street you walk down, every time you turn on the TV, every movie that you watch, you scroll social media, what do you see? Alcohol, alcohol, alcohol. It's truly built into the fabric of our society, but there is a giant shift happening. People are starting to question their beliefs around this drug. They're really starting to ask themselves, what is alcohol really doing for me? And one of the most beautiful things that's happening right now is the discussion is opening up. Some of the most influential thinkers in the world today are spreading new information out there around alcohol. They're waking people up. They're telling people the truth about this drug. So let's listen to some of those ideas and change our worldview. And if you want information on Stop Drinking Coaching, where we help you reframe the way that you view alcohol, just go to SoberClear.com. If we had to make a bad drug legal, the worst choice was alcohol. It's yeah. definitely the case. You might want to put down your drink to hear this. No amount of alcohol is good for your overall health. Even in what are considered relatively small amounts. Even that one glass. Even moderate drinking. Just one drink a day could impact your brain. It's no safe amount of alcohol to drink. It is one of the most destructive drugs to various parts of your, of your body and different organ systems. Alcohol is actually considered a class one carcinogen or cancer causing agent. So that's the same category as benzene and tobacco smoke. Well, alcohol was the seventh greatest risk factor for death and disability. And if you look at the cost of alcohol across the world, it kills 2.8 million people every year. That's almost half the amount of people who die from tobacco. And some studies estimate that a, a drink of alcohol has about the same cancer causing potential as one to two cigarettes. 50% of murders take place in an alcohol fueled environment. Either the victim or the perpetrator or both is drunk. It's, it's almost the sole cause of domestic abuse. It's also the only drug we know that actually makes people more aggressive. No family in Britain which doesn't have someone who's been damaged by alcohol. I mean, about 10% of people become addicted to it one way or another. Far more people than that abuse it. Yes, at least once in their life, yes. We did experiments at, at McGill showing that if you took drunk people and put them in a competitive environment where they could be aggressive and had them keep track of their aggression so they were actually conscious of it, they became more aggressive even rather than less. So yeah, alcohol's bad news and it can turn perfectly good people into, into quite, the, quite the impulsive and dim-witted monsters. Alcohol affects the development of synapses of the Brain. People who drink at an early age heavily have been shown to have significantly smaller brains and reduced cognitive ability. Even a little bit of alcohol causes damage in the brain. It disrupts something called white matter. White matter is the highway in your brain that transmits information and impulses. And even a little bit of alcohol has been shown to disrupt the white matter in the brain. Alcohol is, it's, it's well, it's a hell of a, it's a hell of a drug, man. The overwhelming majority of people who consume alcohol, it's to help unwind or, you know, celebrate the end of a day, or it's usually a mechanism to take you out of a less ideal place and bring you into a more relaxed place. In fact, most addiction does not begin with the search for getting banged up. You know, most addicts didn't wake up one day and go, I want to get really banged up. They woke up one day and said, I want to feel normal. And it was a search for normalcy that led to an addiction. Doing the same things if you keep reproducing the same experiences and feeling the same emotions, your biology begins to become hardwired in a sense. It, be, uh, it, it becomes programmed. It, it is just hardwired in animals to modulate their own neurochemistry. This is exactly why we do drugs, why I say that people have addictions, right. even though most people will not think of them as addictions. You're trying to fiddle with the knobs on your brain like that's what this game is and very so i'm true. saying hey word you're gonna fiddle with your knobs we all are be very careful that the knobs that you're fiddling with do not create a state where you're constantly chasing something so you don't feel good and then once they had a physical addiction now they're running from a low they're not running towards a high if you talk to a true al alcoholic a true drug, drug addict very often that habit is continuing because they do not want to go off the, the that cavernous hole that's right behind them. And it's not that they are any longer chasing chasing that high. It is a learned behavior. So, so most people don't just go to a bar and have a drink and suddenly they're addicted to alcohol. You know what's amazing to me is how the people who make alcohol get a free ride. I don't know how we got it in our heads to, to treat one like it's completely taboo and the other we kind of shrug. I mean, it's crazy.
right? It's like, it is. this is yeah. the drug that is causing so many problems for young people, particularly yeah. on campuses. Sure. And the schools are hand in glove with the manufacturers of it. If alcohol wasn't a thing, and you like, I've invented this drink that is gonna make you like either really happy or really aggressive or really stupid, and we're gonna just sell it to the masses, people would be like, Nah, mate, keep your funky juice. Like, we don't want that. That sounds yeah. terrible. And it's one of those things, because it is so socially acceptable, that the addiction side of it, the bad sides of it, really do fly under the radar. There, there is a lot of pressure on young people not to drink necessarily, but to find happiness through going out and getting mashed. But if it doesn't work for you, and if you keep waking up going, hmm, I don't seem to be having nearly as good time as most of my friends, uh, then, you know, then think about it. It doesn't have to be something you do, is what I, all I'd say to people. I wasn't the case that most people would think of in the sense that my life was totally fine on paper. I had a job at a magazine everyone knew, you know, I had a house, I had a car, that sort of thing. Internally, I was just a, a total mess, and it's kind of like the walls were caving in. And I tried to quit drinking a lot of times. Chris was gone 2012, I lost my father 2014. The two most important male figures in my life. I was trying everything to drown the pain and the frustration and the suffering of those losses by overworking, over-drinking, over-smoking weed and cigarettes. It was one shot, two shot. What does four feel like? What does eight feel like? And all of a sudden I'm taking 12 shots of vodka, you know, on a school night by myself. Starts off as a fun little thing and then it turns into a, an escape and then all of a sudden you don't really, you don't remember why you're out there doing stuff. And initially alcohol really saved me. It taught me how to be a social person. Like I enjoyed going to parties and I enjoyed figuring out how to talk to people. And it was really this fuel that transformed me from this navel gazing insecure kid into somebody who felt like I could comport myself in a social situation as long as I was using alcohol. But very slowly over time, you know, my life, the quality of my life just sort of declined and declined and declined. I used to drink and take drugs to get away from the depression because when I was drunk or high, then I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't think about being depressed. I thought about being um, a, a boxing champion or I'm um, a feel great. I knew that my drinking was causing um, problems in my life across the board. I mean, like, you know, I had less money. It was eating into my bank account. It was kind of, it was messing with some of my relationships. Um, I would never feel good. The three days after I would go out on a bender, right? I would just be like a, a mess. It got so bad that I got to the weight of 340 pounds. I'm not even built to be that heavy. It's very hard to have relationships when you're doing drugs and, uh, and drinking. I, for me personally, anyway. and uh, you become closed off unreceptive, insensitive, all the dreadful things that you've heard every other pop singer ever say. At the end, I was alone, alienated from my friends. My family didn't want anything to do with me until I sorted this out. Living in a sh shitty apartment with barely any furniture, sleeping on a mattress on the floor. And it was, it, was, it was very dark for a very long period of time. I started to drink more and more and more, and it was really hard for me to accept that that meant I was an alcoholic. I was like, I can just go back. I was fine before. You know, I just had to take a break. I just need to slow down. I just need to, I, I'm okay. You know what I mean? This isn't me. And I start to drink every day. And I come home from work and I start to drink and I just sit there and drink till I pass out on the couch. Why and I'll not? tell you, I drank every single night of my life and I never thought I could live without it. It was more just that I lost everything. I was practically homeless, unable to hold down like a waiting tables job. My friends all started to abandon me because I was very angry and, and a horrible human being to be around. And then finally, like, my girlfriend, who I never thought would leave me, like, left me. It's, you just become an awful human being. Like, you just, you're selfish. And, you know, it was started off with this, then it became that. And then my wife started getting on me, like, Jesus Christ, look at the size of And I started, I go, it's a home pour. Eight minutes left in the show, pour another one. So I poured the other one, and it was over, and I was walking down the stairs to our bedroom, and I didn't know if she was still up or not. I literally was hiding it on the side of my leg, trying to make sure the ice cube wasn't going to clink against the side <laughs> of the glass. You know, in my case, the quickest way of forgetting about the fact that you were being watched was to get very drunk, um, and then... As you get very drunk, you become aware that, oh, people are watching more now because now I'm getting very drunk. So I should probably drink more to ignore that more. And it just went from bad to worse. I hit the drink heavily on a daily basis. I was out all night partying with, with uh, women of the night and not coming home. And I didn't care about boxing. I didn't care about living. I just wanted to die. Because I'm negative and I'm dark. And I want to do bad stuff. I want, my, I want to hang out in my, this neighborhood alone. That's dangerous to hang out in this neighborhood alone up here, right? 
He wants to kill everything. He wants to kill me too. Alcohol is a really clever drug. Alcohol is a very promiscuous drug. It gets into the brain and it changes all the good neurotransmitters that you want to change. You know, a bit of endorphins, a bit of serotonin, but it gradually it sort of eats, it worms its way into you. So eventually it kind of takes over and you get to the situation like they just find themselves drink. They don't even intend to drink. They're just suddenly there drinking. They don't know how they got there. They don't want to do it. They don't even enjoy it very much, but they can't stop. It becomes a compulsion. From the first time that I ever drank alcohol, I got that warm feeling. I got that like losing my inhibition feeling and I wanted another one and then after that I wonder what six was like I wonder what eight was like hmm eight's fun what's ten like so there's an increase in dopamine and an increase in serotonin so it's kind of an increase in well-being an increase in mood very soon after and actually triggered by that increase is a long and slow reduction in dopamine and serotonin and related molecules and circuits what you're getting is a blip of feel good followed by a long slow arc of feeling not so great which is why typically people will drink again and again across the night and many people make the mistake of then going and pursuing the dopamine evoking, the dopamine releasing activity or substance again, thinking mistakenly that it's going to bring up their baseline. It's going to give them that peak again. Not only does it not give them a peak, their baseline gets lower and lower because they're depleting dopamine more and more and more. You know, you might say, well, why do people drink too much? It's like, if you like alcohol, that's a stupid question. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's like, why do people drink too much? Well, because it's great. But as we know, when the drink wears off, it only leaves you with a bad hangover and feeling even more depressed. For someone who suffers with mental health, the worst thing we can do to escape it is take drugs or alcohol. But yeah, that's the most common approach. And that's the common approach because people, we don't know. It makes you more extroverted and mm -hmm. enthusiastic while you're on the ascending limb of the blood alcohol curve, which is why you have to keep drinking mm -hmm. once you start. Because if you plateau, that yeah. goes away. So you got to keep drinking. Okay, so that's one thing. It makes you more enthusiastic and, and more full of positive emotion. And the second thing it does is reduce anxiety. Yeah. And so if you are a bit more socially anxious and you also have that positive response to alcohol, which everyone doesn't have, by the way, then it's a great drug. But the problem is it's, well, it's a great drug for the moment. Right. <laughs> right. There's, there's consequences. It was like this feeling of, oh my God, this is what I've been searching for my whole life. I'm my truest self, right? Like I'm so much funnier and cooler and people like me. That's all bullshit. Don't think people understand how once you get beyond one to two drinks, like how harmful it is on your liver. I'm, I'm constantly amazed at how much people drink, even when there's no apparent reason for it, right? So you can always come up with a great reason of a drink. So I think that, um, that that to me is an asymmetric and unnecessary risk, meaning the pleasure that they're getting from that, you know, those four shitty Budweiser's that they have right. isn't anything worth the potential downside it's causing in the long run, which says nothing, by the way, of how often I think people do get behind the wheel of their car when they've had a drink in them. And if there's one thing I've learned in the simulator, it's how even one drink compromises your ability when it matters. Alcohol, ethanol, which is the alcohol we drink, is toxic. Its toxicity is non-linear, so its toxicity kind of goes like this, meaning at low levels, it's just a little bit of an increase, but the more you drink, the more it becomes toxic. But there is no dose of ethanol that is helpful. It is the poison, the acetylaldehyde itself, that leads to the effect of being inebriated or drunk. I think most people don't realize that, that being drunk is actually a poison-induced disruption in the way that your neural circuits work. In thinking about the biochemical effects of alcohol and what it's doing to the body, what it's doing in all cases, it's consumed into the gut, the liver immediately starts this conversion, the ethanol to acetylaldehyde to acetate, and some amount of acetylaldehyde and acetate are making it into the brain. It crosses the blood-brain barrier. Most things, thankfully, can't pass across the blood-brain barrier, but alcohol, because it's water and fat soluble, just cruises right across this fence and into the milieu, the environment of the brain. So it goes into every nook and cranny in the brain, and there it has lots of influences. So it slows down the excitatory signals, it speeds up the inhibitory signals. There's a slight suppression in the activity of neurons in the prefrontal cortex. This is an area of your neocortex that's involved in thinking and planning, perhaps above all, in suppression of impulsive behavior. And as you shut down the prefrontal cortex, that GABAergic suppression of impulses starts to be released. So people will say things that they want to say without so much forethought about what they're saying. Or they might do things that they want to do without really thinking it through quite as much, or they might not even remember thinking it through at all. One of the more important things to know about the effects of alcohol in the brain is areas of the brain 
that are involved in flexible behavior, sort of considering different options, like I could do A or I could do B. Those brain areas basically shut down. Probably the most common detriment that alcohol has to the brain is the fact that alcohol is a depressant to the central nervous system. So it impairs your judgment, it impairs your reflexes, and your ability to think through. And top-down inhibition is diminished. That is habitual behavior and impulsive behavior starts to increase. This is true in the short term. So after people have one or two, maybe three or four drinks, but it's also true that the more often that people drink, there are changes in the very circuits that underlie habitual and impulsive behavior. For the person that drinks say every Thursday night or goes out only on Saturdays, but every Saturday, there's evidence that there are changes in the neural circuits of the brain that control habitual behavior and impulsive behavior. And they are modified and strengthened in ways that make those people more habitual and more impulsive outside the times in which they are drinking. And when they drink, impulsive and habitual behavior tends to increase even further. You know, you see your friend drinking, you smell it, you, you see a movie where someone's drinking red wine or whatever. Then you start physically craving. Like now you can't get it off your mind and you're, you're uncomfortable in your skin. So you say to yourself, well, I've been sober for two months. I don't have a problem and you have a drink. That's what this little trickster in your brain tells you. You're fine, you've been sober for two months. You don't have an alcohol problem, have one. And then that one turns into you coming home with a bottle two nights later and that comes into you opening up your wine cellar again. That's what happened to me. And now drinking heavier than you did before. I wasn't drinking because I had a crummy childhood or because I was suffering from any personal trauma. I was drinking because I was physically addicted to alcohol. So I'd pick up the first drink, I'd like the feeling, I'd have another drink, I'd really like the feeling, and then it was past drink two, whew, don't remember. Addiction is really um, consistently choosing a short-term reward at the expense of long-term growth. And um, yet I couldn't stop. I mean, that's the key, right? As you go, I know this is screwing me up. I know it. And then I tell myself, you know what? Maybe it'll be different this time. Like, I'm just gonna have one or two drinks this time. And then you have one or two and you go, well, if one or two is this good, what would like 10 more be like, right? And something shifts in your head. When you're in it, there's no way you can look outside yourself and say, oh, that's the hallmark of alcoholic. You know, I can look back now and say, wow, okay, there were clear signs, but of course you don't see them yourself. It went slowly from being a work hard, play hard, have a drink, to two drinks, to three drinks, to then a habit, to then a daily habit, to then a 24 seven habit, to then a every weekend habit, getting lost in myself habit. The addiction elevator is always going down. It only moves in one direction. The best case scenario is that person's life stays the same, but in almost every case, it continues to decline. Sometimes if you don't watch the kind of habits that you're building, they become lifestyles. And not every lifestyle leads to roads uh, of riches and benefits and incentives and a great life. Some roads lead to death, they lead to struggle, anxiety, depression, and all of the opposite things that somebody wants for their life, and I was there. Before I knew it, I was digging myself a hole, and everywhere I looked, it was so dark, and I lost myself. I spiraled into a sense of no self-worth. I hit rock bottom to the point where I almost lost my job, to the point where some people had to have very tough conversations with me. Some friends had to deal with my drama, and they say hurting people hurt people. I was hurting inside and I was hurting others that didn't even know it. You do stupid things when you're drunk. You hurt yourself, you, you compromise your health. It's really hard on the people around you. You tend to turn into a liar and it screws up your life. My son is talking to me and he tells me, I ain't never been this scared dad, but I'm, I'm scared you're gonna die. I lost grandpa already, I can't lose you too. Can you please stop drinking? Can you please stop smoking? Can you please get back to the daddy that I know you to be? All that Busta Rhymes shit was cool up until this moment. If I go out and watch people drinking, it makes everybody stupid and fuzzy-minded. And, you know, the problem is, is when you're drinking, you think you're cool, but, you know, you have those same delusions that, that Homer Simpson's friend Barney had when he was drinking, that you're this kind of, you know, elegant and, and sophisticated comedian, and it just makes everybody stupid. And what's better isn't being straight and, 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 and not making mistakes. It's like, that's all prohibition in some sense. What's mm -hmm. better is, no, you need an adventure, man. You need to get out there and have something to do. Yeah. And, and something worth waking up for. And you need, that's the substitute for the addiction. And we've been brainwashed by alcohol industries to believe that quitting is really hard. It's part of their propaganda. They're the ones pushing that message, which seems like, why would they tell people it's hard? But they're doing that because if it's hard, you won't quit.
The thing I ask people is this, is alcohol adversely affecting any part of your life? That can mean anything from your relationships to working out in the morning. Is it affecting, adversely affecting any part of your life? If the answer is yes, then you need to address it. If you and I were to sit here and um, I were just to, you were to start punching me at random, sucker punching me, <laughs> like would I stand here and let you beat the piss out of me? Like I would hope not, right? But in life, we let life beat the piss out of us. And we make our circumstances even worse by when a negative event happens, we get depressed or we feel pity for ourselves or we turn to quick fixes like drugs, alcohol, and it makes our situation worse. So when you unpack the layer and you give that tough love of saying, you know what, like you need to fucking change. Like you need to look at yourself in the mirror and stop being a victim, stop blaming other people and take ownership for yourself and stop waiting for other people to fix your life. You can't get sober for somebody else. I'm getting sober for my spouse or my kids, or you know, I'm getting sober because if I don't, my boss is gonna fire me. None of that shit works. I had to and wanted to get sober because I said, I deserve more. I deserve more out of this life. I have to try it a different way. And I have to be willing to just commit to it. If you're honest with yourself and you have some degree of self-awareness, understand what you care about, I think choices become a lot clearer. Like there's way, way more clarity about how to live your life in, in the micro, which is really what we're talking about. These just mini choices throughout the day. Does it support who you wanna be in the world or does it not? And, and there's very little gray actually. And the gray are excuses in, in my view. And, and we can rationalize and make stuff up all day long, right? To, to, to make ourselves feel better. But when you can step back from all of that and look at it really, you know, taking yourself kind of out of the equation and look at it from a, a very objective standpoint, I think a choice like alcohol becomes very clear. So in order to change uh, something to arrive at a new vision of your future, if you weren't wanted to arrive at a new goal or a new vision of your future, you'd have to change something about yourself in order to get there. And you'd have to change the way you think, the way you act and the way you feel. Most people then, they have that vision of the future, but they give up on that vision because in order for them to arrive at that vision, they have to do something. They have to think differently. They have to act differently. They have to feel differently. And it's so much easier to make the same choice every single day. And the hardest part about change is not making the same choice as you did the day before. And the moment you decide to make a different choice, you're going to feel uncomfortable because you're stepping from the known into the unknown. So some people would rather cling to their self-pity than take a chance in possibility. They'd rather tell the story of their past instead of telling the story of their future. They'd rather believe in their past instead of believe in their future. So what really helped me was when my cellmate took me, looked me in the face and he said, Doug, you can either be a man or you can be a bitch. And I really believe, Tom, that we're not defined by our circumstances, we're defined by the choices we make in response to our circumstances. Mm -hmm. You can, you know, man up and do what you need to do to get better. Or you can be a bitch, go cry in the corner, blame everybody for your problems, say woe is me. And where I came from, where I grew up, I mean, being called a bitch isn't cool. And I was like, you know what? I'll take the opportunity of being a man. And if you don't do this, you're probably gonna die early, by the way. I realized I had to just rip off the Band-Aid and do the hard thing. And once I went through that process, my life improved across the board. I had to really, really believe in myself, even though I internally shouldn't have, right? The odds were stacked against me, but I had to keep believing if I knew that if I could just become a better version of myself each and every day, that I had faith that things would like get better. And once I got my health, and once I got my mind and I got my spirit right, and I started to be proud of me, when I looked at me and my kids was looking at me and they would say shit that you could only hear once you did what you needed to do and put in the work you needed to put in so that it shows. Um, we're either forced to change or we choose to change. Every day you have a choice. Life is a reflection of the daily choices that we make in our lives. You choose the books, you choose the personal development, you choose the leadership, you choose to create something, to work on something, to be an entrepreneur, an intrapreneur, an entrepreneur holding himself or herself to higher standards, to go above and beyond and to be able to experience the delayed gratification. That's one route. That's one choice every day. Or is it the one drink, two drinks, three drinks, selfish, my goals, my dreams, my desires, but they're unclear. So really all it is, is filling a void, filling a gap in the heart and escaping into something that maybe does not lead to any of those things. 
there was something that we called the higher taste. And it was saying you can never give up a lower taste unless you add a higher taste. Sure. And so there has to be a switch. There has to be a replacement. Has to be a replacement. And 100%. so the fact that you found alternatives, I think that's half the battle. Sure. Because most of us are trying to take something out of our lives and then you're just trying to fill it. Yeah. And then you have to go back to what you had before because you're not finding a replacement. So the second thing you said, which I loved, which was having this conversation and dialogue with other people, someone who's one year ahead of you, someone who's 10 years ahead, someone sure. who's 20 years ahead, who's gone through that process and they're open and honest and vulnerable about, you know what? did have a weak moment or you know what this was really tough for me and I think having those communities where you can talk about these things makes a massive difference funny thing is if you're trying to stop drinking you need something better than alcohol mm -hmm. and alcohol is pretty good yeah so you better find something a lot yeah. better man <laughs> yeah and then it is and then esteemable people do esteemable things it's like yeah well you want to you want to figure out something that you're doing with your life that's worth not getting drunk and screwing up that's exactly what happened to me in Prince George it was exactly that conversation with myself and initially I decided six months off and then I just never went back to it. Like there were times I was like, man, I could never be a sober person mm -hmm. because I'm afraid of, you know, I can't communicate with women or I'm afraid to, you know, stand around in a circle with tough guys without having like a beer in my yep. hand, you know, or like all these little crutches, you know, yep. I can't. And then I remember when I got like 90 days sober, I was just like, holy shit, man. Like it was like the first time I'd ever done something like for myself, yep. you know? Yeah. And it just, man, it felt, it felt unprecedented yeah you can only change your life if you want to change it and i, I left and everyone said are you going home early i said yeah i left at nine o'clock i went home and i got back home i didn't say anything to the wife i went straight upstairs into a dark room and i was, I was sat there and i got on my knees and i was praying and begging god to help me after praying for about 10 minutes i got up and i felt the weight of the world was lifted off my shoulders and for the first time in years i knew i was going to make a comeback how long have you been sober now 15 years friggin saved my life saved uh, our family um, and working through that stuff so very grateful for my wife she's the one that didn't ask for this shit she walked through fire with me and we walked out together stronger way stronger than we ever would have been before I haven't drank uh, took drugs in six days and for me that's a miracle I've been lying to everybody else to think I was sober but I'm not it's my sixth day. I'm never going to use again. It was my first sober Christmas, first sober New Year, and honestly, it was the best I've ever had. I'm so thankful that this is happening. My relationships with my friends, my family, everybody around me are so good and have been for so many years now. I wouldn't do anything to destroy that again. I was running to things to avoid, to avoid tough feelings, painful feelings. I just didn't know how to deal with them and looking for anything I found that I, I, I use for escape, to escape those kinds of, um, I guess, difficult feelings. I don't want to be, I don't want to, at this point, to be running from anything. I want to sit in it, I want to feel it, I want to get through the rough night. And I found um, in doing so, you just, you come out the other side with a, a more profound understanding of yourself, a, a greater gratefulness for those in your life, the birds and the trees and everything else. And I was like, I'm not giving up my fun. Yeah. And I could never imagine, well, so when I want to get married, I'm not going to have a drink. So when I have a kid, I'm not going to have a whiskey. Guess what? Yes, I didn't have any of that. And it's awesome. It was the best thing I ever did. Uh, enabled me to have a, a, a solid marriage and kids and a career. And I didn't end up a crazy actor. Waking up 100%, 100% of the time. Because there are a lot of challenges, again, that you wake up when, when we're being asked to be this active and this on and this focused and we're gonna be making these big changes we wanna see. I don't wanna wake up feeling groggy, I wanna wake up feeling ready. On the surface level, your health changes, you look better, feel better, you walk taller, you start getting in shape, you go to the gym, you drop the weight, the beer belly and all the nasty side effects that come with it. I never looked back. A whole new world opened up to me. People report better sleep, better sex, regulated weight. They report clearer skin. People report that their anxiety dissipates. Many people say they find a sense of purpose. They find that suddenly they can take on new challenges. They can start a new career. They can form a charity. They can write the book they always wanted to write. And then like, it is that thing where it's just, you know, your life just changes and people are nice to you finally when like no one's been nice to you. You've li lived in a world like, like the drinking world and the kind of druggy world that I was in 
just like everybody's miserable and they're all mean to each other yeah constantly you're just nasty all the time and then you like go to a meeting and people are like hey man like it's so confusingly wonderful. I don't miss it generally, like now at all. Like I, like the the sort of chaos I used to invite into my life. Um, I'm like, I'm I'm really much happier now. I, for maybe the first time, am proud of myself that I didn't quit quitting. Unbelievable. Better. Oh, are you kidding? I would never be sitting here with you. No way. No chance. Because? Because I wouldn't have been able to have access to myself or other people, or even been able to take in other people uh, if I hadn't changed my life, no way. And I never would have been able to have relationships that I do. I never would have been able to take care of my father the way I did when he was sick, so many things. Now, sometimes they talk about you have an epiphany, and I did. It was one day my wife was out, and I was opening up a new, and I thought, am I out of my mind? Yes, and I made a phone call, and I've been sober ever since. That was 32 years ago. It's a very odd feeling. But I had some great people. I spoke to some people at the time. It's one of those things that you don't even, don't even question. Every time the, the chip's not been in control, I've screwed up. And God knows I've screwed up so many times. Oh my gosh, I've screwed up so many times when my chip has not been controlled. This is why I don't like alcohol. And this is why I don't like drugs. Because you're, you're not in control. A substance is doing that, right? But it's a good thing that you have this rage. Because if we can take this, you know, 97 octane fuel and we put it in the right engine control oh my gosh so we need to make sure that high octane is controlled because high octane in the wrong place can blow up a building and to this day i've never had a drink and i have no longing for it i have no interest in it to this day i've never had a cigarette don't worry those are only two of my good things i don't want to tell you about the bad thing there's plenty of bad things too but i learned because of fred i learned and that's what I think is so important. This was an idea that I had where if we can teach young people not to take drugs, just not to take them. When I see friends of mine that are having difficulty with not having that drink at dinner, where it's literally almost impossible for them to stop, I say to myself, I can't even understand it. Why would that be difficult? The fact is, if we can teach young people and people generally not to start, it's really, really easy not to take it. Today is the tomorrow you were so worried about yesterday. You young people, don't give up. Just keep in there. Just keep fighting. Be bold. Mighty forces will come to your aid. I think there's an aspect of it that that's clearly has to do with one's own morality because it's too easy to jump on that wagon of it's a disease and my brain's been hijacked and I no longer have a choice in the matter. I think there's that element for sure. But past a certain point, you have to, you have to stand up inside yourself and, and change, you know? Everybody does with any, with any issue. Ultimately, anything else is just a really, you know, new age excuse, if you ask me.